was really great about BP is how much BP attempts to uh, access or attempts to copy uh, particular ways of speaking, arguing, and persuading that happen in daily life, in average everyday daily life. So when I first started BP, the role of the judge was to be an average reasonable person. You've probably heard that phrase before. It's changed. It's changed. Now you hear in world's briefings and you hear at places, um, big tournaments around the world, you hear that the new claim is average reasonable voter, which I think changes things a bit. But BP is focused on audience. It's focused on audience. So there's some, th some things we forget as BP kind of moves forward and kind of uh, advances. So the very first aspect of debating I want to talk about is debating is a practice, not a skill. And to do this, I'm going to tell a great story of something I think is a fascinating rhetorical incident that happened a long time ago featuring this gentleman right here. You know who this is? Alan Iverson. Alan Iverson. Everybody's out. Alan Iverson. Well, two people. And me. <laughs> I didn't know who he was either until I was looking for like interesting things to talk about. Alan Iverson is like Hall of Fame career basketball player. Fantastic guy. But he's probably primarily known for a press conference he gave uh, where people were asking him, why are you missing so much practice? Why are you missing practices? And he kind of got angry. And he said, why are we talking about practice? We're, not, we're talking about missing practice. We're not talking about a game. We're talking about practice. And the result of that, uh, among Philadelphia fans and among the sports journalism community, was this sort of uh, reification or this kind of um, identification that practice is this incredibly important thing towards something more real than it. So it's like working hard, being a hard worker, this kind of thing. This is a very sort of Western notion of what practice means. And it's a very sort of um, uh, causal or positivist notion of practice. And I would, I would encourage you to think of practice as doing the thing. So we think of debate as a skill, as providing certain skills. And we think of practice as getting us ready for the event. But when we are practicing, <laughs> we are doing the thing. When we are speaking and debating, we are doing the thing. There's no place where we are not being persuasive. There's no place where we are not constructing arguments. And I think the Iverson example shows how when you try to uh, push that, it, it, acts, it accesses all these kind of ideologies about work and working hard and um, doing your job and things like that. That's what the Philadelphia press is talking about. Like, if he doesn't go to practice, he's not doing his job. And we all have to go to work. He doesn't have to go to work. So instead of thinking debate as, I need to learn these particular skills, anytime you have a practice debate or anytime you're speaking or anytime you're arguing, this is debate practice, which is also the thing. So it's, I, I would encourage you to adopt a more Eastern view of practice as being the thing. Um, and um, there's some other things to think about with this. This is uh, Wayne Brock Reedy, who's an argumentation scholar. And one of the reasons that we want to think of practice as a skill is if we think of argumentation as a skill, we think of it as a set thing, as a thing, as an object that's been figured out that exists. And argumentation is not like that. Brock Reedy, this is a quote from him. Um, argumentation changes because argumentation is human activity. So it counted as a good argument. Not that long ago, we would laugh at and consider to be nonsense. Not that long ago. You could go through history and sort of do this kind of genealogical analysis and look at different arguments. The kind of arguments that worked only a couple of hundred years ago, we would think of as like, well, that's not an argument at all. It changes because it's a human um, nature and it's a human activity. So when Brock Reedy pointed that out to us, he said argumentation is where people are and people change. And so I wouldn't adhere. There's one thing that gets taught a lot in debate, and it's the Toolman model of argumentation. Are you familiar with the Toolman model? It's like the least important contribution that Stephen Toolman made to argumentation, in my view. I would say the more important one is field dependency, which is this idea that Brock Reedy is pointing out here, you know, 20 years after the fact, that field dependency is the most important thing, which is when you're in front of a group of people, the arguments change because arguments are constructed from what people know, from their experiences, from where they're from, from how they're situated in the world. So the Toolman model is a good analytical tool to figure out that people don't reason the way that we think they do. They reason from cause or sign or different things like that. But uh, Brock Reed sort of points out that um, uh, it's really much more about who's out there and what they are. So when you're, this is kind of a spoiler alert for the end part of the lecture, when you're speaking to your judges, remember that you're not speaking to adhere to or to prove that you understand a particular model of debate. You're speaking to attempt to persuade them. You're speaking to attempt to persuade reasonable people, whatever that looks like. We're not, it's not a, a, a bad argument class where you're being quizzed on the Toolman model. And I think a lot of debates I hear that aren't as engaging or that aren't the debates that 
do extremely well tend to speak in that way where you're speaking as if you're trying to meet a particular theory's goal rather than talk to another human being. So this is a pra you're always practicing this because this is always changing. Uh, very Eastern kind of concept I want you to adapt. This is uh, Suryo Suzuki's part of the big migration of Japanese and masters came in after World War II to the United States. There's a number of them, California, New York, and places like that. It's interesting stuff to read about. There's good books on it if you want to read about the how um, after World War II, the Japanese Buddhism moved to the U.S. Um, this quote is this idea of when you're thinking about practice as gaining, or you're thinking about practice as getting better, one's losing the ability to get actually better. This is also summed up in a great quote by samurai teachers, which is, uh, if you don't um, fight the way you would on the battlefield in the practice room, then there's no point in practicing. There's absolutely no point. Because what you're doing is pairing it back and saying, I'm doing something that will develop my abilities at a later time. You're not doing the thing. So practice is doing the thing. I just wrote a piece on this that came out in a book about teaching forensics. And it's kind of a weird idea because we always think, when we're always taught from when we're very young as part of our culture, that practice is not the thing. But very much like a chemistry class, practice is that we're working with the live chemicals. Like if you say something uh, in order to do better at debate or to practice a particular skill and it upsets somebody, it really upset somebody. Just like if you were in a chemistry lab and you got a chemical burn, you'd be like, oh, how weird. You wouldn't say, wow, this is just practice. I don't, I don't understand how I got burned. It's the exact same thing. We're working with live, this is live fire stuff. So when you're practicing, think of every practice debate as being that great final round that you want to do. And that way it makes you a lot less nervous about competition because every competition is merely practice. It works in a circular way. So every practice is the finals of worlds. And every finals of worlds is another t opportunity to practice. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, great, we're done. No, I'm just kidding. It's kind of a tall order. But I want you to think about this because I think we forget about the value of practice sometimes. Okay, the next thing. Audience is the format. So the other thing I notice about debate is people will speak in ways that they feel like the rules of the format will confirm that they were good, or the rules of the format confirm that it's a good argument, or the rules of the format would confirm that they were persuasive. We need to abandon all of this and think of it in terms of um, what does my audience think? What does the audience think? And in BP, we're somewhat lucky to have a continuum of thought as to what an argument, a good argument would be, which is something a reasonable person could access and judge. So I put this little story up here you can read. The idea of like what kind of debate you're doing or what kind of format or do these rules apply is a question that will inevitably lead to your defeat in debate. Instead, you just want to think about the experience you're in, and, and it's a, that's a real person, that's a human being you're talking to. That's a group of people you're talking to. And it's perfectly acceptable in BP, or it used to be. Nowadays, we're a lot more technical than we used to be. But I'm speaking in terms of someone who's seen a lot of changes from 2004 to like 2018. You know, you watch debates now, and you go and look at debates that were recorded in like 2006, 2007, they're very different. And part of that difference is, I mean, they're both good and bad. I'm not saying one is better than the other. But part of that difference is the idea that people were really trying to say, look, this is what is good, this is what is bad, this is why we know. Instead of speaking in a way that accesses what we would call good BP style or good argument for BP or some kind of a rubric of fairness, which really gets a lot of attention in uh, BP conversations. Fairness might actually be a term that's much more important than persuasion in contemporary BP and something to be aware of, is that motions are written not to generate good debates, but to generate fair ones, and so much as those are in competition or conflict with one another. So I want you to think about this. Think about addressing that audience and thinking about addressing a human audience and not worrying so much about the rules. We'll get into that a little bit, a little bit later. And of course, I will answer rules questions. Don't think that, like if you can't wait to ask me what I think about counterprops, I'll still answer that question. But um, I don't think it's an important question in the terms of what a counterprop is supposed to do. Um, so yeah, here's an audience. I don't know why I put that. Here's Bruce Lee, another good person to think about when you talk about um, style and addiction to style. If we start to think about and talk about things like there's a BP style or a BP set of arguments, we lose the point about what we're trying to do, which is touch or reach other minds. So I'll put a couple of quotes from him in here. I'm going kind of fast because I've had a little bit more time. Um, what we're trying to do is, in, uh, the, one of the things about debate scholarship, which is something I work on and write about, is it always lags. So if you go and read historical debate scholarship in the journals, you'll find that what they're talking about is something that most debaters at the time would consider to be old. So if there's an article from 
the 1980s about utopian counterplans or something in policy debate. That practice is probably on its way out, uh, is what I've learned from kind of looking at this. Because the practitioners are always the ones shaping the, you guys have all the power. You guys have all the power. So what you choose to do, if you decide to say, well, this is the way it ought to be done, and you practice like that, you're creating the reality of what the event is. And if you decide, well, I'm going to try to be a little more aspirational and make this something a little bit more, um, less about restrictions and rules or restrictions and format, more about accessing other people's minds, then I think you're really getting somewhere. And I think that that's something that's really, um, you guys get to shape what this looks like. There's a very famous exchange between uh, rhetorical scholar Kenneth Burke and the poet William Carlos Williams. Does anybody know who those two people are? Besides Sarah? <laughs> you know who those people are. Does anybody know who William Carlos Williams is? Yeah, you do? Good. Okay, that's great. One person, that's great. That makes me, gives me a little faith. William Carlos, there's no reason you should know him. He's a famous American poet. But you probably had to learn like one of his poems. He was like a doctor in New Jersey and he wrote poetry on the side. And he wrote all kinds of, he's considered to be a great American poet. But he was friends with Kenneth Burke, his rhetorical critic. And uh, Kenneth Burke reviewed some of his poems, and uh, he wrote him an angry letter. He was like, who are you to tell me you know, what I should write, and da da da, you know, typical kind of thing. And Burke just responded and said, look, I'm a critic. I don't get to say what poetry is. I'm in the worst possible position. You know who gets to say what poetry is? Poets. And then I get to critique whatever it was they, they did. So judges, you might think judges have all the power, but they're actually kind of in this Burkean position. Where it's like, you guys present the debate, I just critique what you give me. I'm just critiquing what you give me. You guys get to decide what that looks like. And if you have aspirational goal for it to look a particular way, or if you don't want to do all the like um, the stuff that's like trendy or what people are doing in the format, try to do something that kind of breaks through or pushes through to bring yourself to a higher sort of level. Don't become addicted to style or addicted to a particular way of doing it. I guess what I say. Oh yeah, this is stuff from the. Um, this is all too small to read, I think, in here. Um, this is all stuff about the way that BP globally considers the audience, and I think it's interesting to think about. Um, this is all available online. I can send you the link. This is from the, um, the Dutch World's Guide of How to Judge. So they define persuasiveness, uh, which they say is, is, it is impossible for an argument to be persuasive merely because it was stylish, which is kind of an odd thing. A lot of times we're persuaded by something because it just sounded amazing. And then we thought, wow, it's true. Or it's true because it sounds amazing, or the amazingness helped us access what is true. So it's a very limited understanding of persuasion. I think it's a very limited understanding of persuasion. And I also think it's uh, nearly impossible to separate things like style from content or style from evidence or things like that. For example, evidence that's permitted in the court of law has a particular style to it, and that's how we know it can be admitted in the court. Very much like uh, the kind of evidence that you'd want in a political campaign, you're looking for a particular style of thing, and if somebody mentions something, you're like, well, that's not evidence. So these kind of things, evident, and in a competitive debate, which is something near and dear to our hearts, every, every format has its own style of what evidence ought to look like, or proof, broadly, broadly proof, or uh, uh, paistis in the uh, ancient Greek. It has a particular style. So it's odd to think that um, you could get away from that. So these are all kind of long uh, slides, but the thing I want to point out is this Ordinary intelligent voter standard is something that you're going to have to grapple with. Um, and what an ordinary intelligent voter is seems incredibly disconnected from all the things that we would want to know before we speak to an audience. It's almost like Slavoj Žižek's critique of um, uh, positive or materialist nihilism, which he uses the example of caffeine-free Diet Coke. When you drink a caffeine-free Diet Coke, what are you drinking? All of the elements that make it a Coke have been removed. So what is it that you're consuming in that can? What's in there? Like, the nothing. The nothing. Not like you never need story of the nothing, but um, like the material commercial product of the nothing. And I would say the World's Council has done the same thing here with the ordinary intelligent voter, which all of these terms are rooted to terms they want to be far away from. Culture, sociology, anthropology, history. They want to be divorced from all this. And they want a neutral voter who's ordinary, I don't know what that means. Ordinary is always determined by cultural and, and social forces. I don't know what intelligent mean. intelligence means. That's a performance, sir. Uh, it's not an ontological state that is cross-cultural. Cross Somebody who's very intelligent in one cultural situation might be considered an idiot in another one, just because they simply don't know how to cross the street, or they don't know how to use the eating utensils. So this is a dream. This is a long-held dream is what the the BP folks are getting into here, which is the dream of having a pure persuasion, a persuasion that can't have any interference, and we'll just look at the facts, and we'll be able to determine. But if you were to debate like that, you're going to be very frustrated, because you'll say, well, I followed the rules, but you'll lose all the time. 
And the reason why is because they're absolutely not interested in this standard. What they're interested in is somebody who presents compelling and interesting reasons of why their arguments are the highest quality in the room. Not necessarily answering everything, not necessarily dealing with all the arguments the other side talks about, but providing clear and compelling high quality reasons for why their position is the best one. That's really what it's about. And so a lot of the things about um, what an ordinary intelligent voter would um, want is this desire for reasons that are clear and compelling. That's really what they want, I think, after reading these documents for years and being frustrated. Uh, they're really highly Cartesian. Like they just want there to be this kind of uh, emotional, like mind body split and leave your body in the van. Like they really just kind of want this pure rational thing. It's a failure. And rhetorical theory can show us that it's a failure of a thing too. Um, and these are all very funny about what the intelligent voter is. They're well informed about political social affairs, but they're not from anywhere. They're intelligent to be able to act, assess contrasting arguments, including sophisticated arguments, but previously they said they're not going to be influenced by sophistry, so I don't understand why they would suddenly be influenced by sophisticated arguments when they're not persuaded by sophistry. Same Greek root, which means wisdom. Um, and then uh, they're, it's, they're, kind of, they're uh, unlike most or perhaps any real world people, but the concept of the ordinary intelligence vote is a useful way of revealing a set of important characteristics that judges should aspire to in order to ensure all teams receive a fair hearing. They're going for fairness. So they, they value fairness so much in BP that they would eliminate all the interesting elements, very much like caffeine free Diet Coke, all of the interesting elements from the substance, which would be social and cultural considerations. I say you can bring those things in as evidence, as proof, as ways to contextualize argument as examples. So a lot of times middle range debaters will say, we're gonna set this debate in X. We're gonna frame this debate in this country. We're gonna frame this debate in the EU. Or almost like boilerplate, like you have to say it, like it's liturgy, like we're in the church of debate or something. You won't be listened to if you don't say, we're going to have this debate in, uh, in Western liberal democracies. Like, again, something I don't know what that is. Like, can we, <laughs> you know, especially in this climate, where you look at parliamentary election results across the world, and you look at election results in this country, and you look at the way politics are going, do, they, do these places still exist? Um, and all these things are highly questionable. Like, do we have a democracy in the United States? That's a live question. Very highly questionable, right? Um, do they have a democracy in the UK? Yeah. Uh, it depends on what you define it as, right? You can look at Brexit and say, well, is that a democratic, is that the way democracies function? Is holding something like that? And you might say at first, yes, but there's a wealth of information and stuff you can read on to say maybe that wasn't the best way to handle that. Um, so I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that what they want is for judges to be fair in their decision making. And there are ways to bring in all these assumptions as examples instead of framing. So instead of saying, in, you know, take the debate as it is, but instead of saying we want to set it in the United States or set it in the EU, say let's look at an example of the United States. Let's look at an example of the EU. Let's look at an example of the UK. This way you can marshal a large amount of your own knowledge on the debate topic in a way that shows that you have the highest quality, best analyzed points to the judge instead of trying to win on some kind of a BP style point or BP rules of like, we didn't set the debate correctly. Now a bad judge might say that to you and you might have nothing to do about it, but I, they're going to be less inclined to say that to you if you're able to say, look, here's why the motion is true or false. We give you an example of Costa Rica. We give you the example of the African Union. We give you the example of Venezuela. We give you the example of France. We give the example of China. You know, one of the things I always tell people to think about if you're trying to think about generating things to say is always think about what would good governments do. It's almost like the little Jesus bracelets. What would Jesus do? Remember that? Or is that too old for you? Are those still around? Yeah, WWJD. Yeah, Are those still around or is that like long I mean, ago? I had a bunch of older siblings, so oh. they left around the house. Oh, okay, so they're just kind of around the house as like <laughs> fossils or like evidence of the past civilization that collapsed or something. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. It's kind of the way older siblings are treated. Right? Like, wow, look at what they, look, was this currency? Where are these things? Like, everywhere. Um, huh? What is this? Yeah, right. It's like, what? how did they function? What was this? You know? um, it's funny to think like a future story like that. Wow, what is this thing? Um, what WWGGD? You know, WWG. What do the good governments do? So this provides a research agenda for you to become good this season, which is you need to be able to speak to every country in the world that you think has a good government. Which a good litmus for that, and I know this is like broad brush, would be countries that everyone's trying to move to and live in that have strict immigration standards of getting in. And then there are countries that are the opposite of that, which is countries where people can't wait to leave, but the government doesn't let them leave. 
Like, that would be the opposite. That's not a good government. So this is a, I mean, there's other ways to define what you think a good government is, and I encourage you to explore that. But this provides a research agenda for you, and that research agenda would be like, I need to be able to say what these countries' policy is on things like education, uh, fiscal policy, on security, on military, on uh, humanitarian intervention, on rights. I need to be able to say with certainty what all these good governments do, and I need to be able to access that very quickly. I need to know it. I need to know it, because when you get into the debate, you'll need to provide those examples to prevent to provide quality. You need to say, let's look at an example of Indonesian education, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at an example of, in, of South Korean education and how they do it. Let's look to an example of Dutch education, or whichever country. I mean, I'm just giving examples, but this is a much better way to do it than say, we frame this debate in the EU, and then that's somehow supposed to make them not be able to access good arguments. You'll lose. You'll lose, because you've made the debate low quality because you did that. Uh, it's much, much better to make these things examples. This is kind of an aside, but I think that's what they're looking for. And uh, let's look at some, we can look at some rhetorical stuff on this. I'll put way too many slides in here. So here's the big comparison. So what is debate more like? Is it more like platform diving the Olympics? Or is it more like American football? What is debate more like? American football, I mean, you can answer, I mean, you can answer it if you want to. I don't know platform diving. Why? Why, why? Um, when it comes to football, there's a lot of intricate rules you have to abide by, um, you know, having like seven people on the line, um, only having a specific amount of people that can run out for routes and pass yeah. and all forward, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, and there's like, you're out of bounds at some point, mm -hmm. and then that's the end of the play. Um, and I think we like to think of debate like this, but the only out of bounds there are are the rules in the world's constitution, or whatever the rules are for the tournament you're going to, which would be things like, you speak for seven minutes, no more, okay, got it, there's not a lot of complicated theory there. POIs are only allowed in the five minutes in the middle. I think I understand the theory behind that. Uh, people will take turns speaking. You're not supposed to interrupt a speaker and be like, bullshit. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, what other rules are there? Uh, you're not supposed to like um, uh, hand a bunch of like um, evidence to your partner to race through. I don't know if that's in the rules. I've seen people read out of magazines and stuff, but it's weird, right? It's weird. I don't know if that would help you. But it's a lot more like platform diving. The gentleman's right here. I think it's a lot more like this because it's you start at a particular point and you're all going to end at a particular point with judgment. But what you do in the interim time is really kind of up to you. And the quality and complexity of what you do, the quality of it and how you do it is how you're going to win. In football, there's only a couple of different ways to win. We like to imagine a debate like this because it's more comfortable. There are these rules that say what a good argument is and what a good argument isn't. But platform diving also mirrors the way argument is in the world, which is there are no rules for what makes an argument good or bad, unless the speaker is savvy enough to make those rules appear, appear natural. Right? So if a speaker is savvy enough and say, no smart person would accept this format of argument. They wouldn't accept this. It's a fallacy, Mr. Speaker. Okay, that's an argument. There's no rule book that they're going to pull out, like the fallacy ref. Have you seen that meme? Where it's like the football referee and it's like, ad hominem, 15 yards. There's, this person doesn't exist. And fallacies are not necessarily wrong. You have to persuade the audience they're wrong. They're a tool in a very large toolkit about you saying, look, you know, and the ultimate rhetorical position on this kind of stuff in persuasion is to say, um, look, I'm not here to persuade you at all. You can make up your own mind. I'm going to present you the facts. And at the end of that, you can make your own decision. Now, that's a wonderful persuasive tool. It's not going to work in debate. It works in the real world. You're like, look, I'm not, you, you can make your own decision. I'm not going to tell you how to think. But here's the facts. Now, the facts have always been a slice of reality that I choose that helps my case. That's what I'm always going to do. I would be an idiot if I decided to present you with great fairness and passion in my opponent's case. But even that could be strategic. There are no rules for this. The only rule is you have to leave the board and you have to hit the water. And the judges are going to judge that performance. And that's what debate's like. It's not like this at all. It's like, oh, we score, we got a touchdown, or we move the, you know, it's not like this at all. Although sometimes I use football metaphors to teach debate, which is kind of problematic, but I just don't know enough about platform diving to use the metaphors, but I'm working on it and study it, <laughs> read about it. You know, but the Olympics, they only come around every so often. Now I have a friend who's an expert in the Olympics that tell me it comes around every four years. I was, I was stunned. But that's what expertise gets you, is that kind of insight. <laughs> uh, yeah, audience is the format. So this is Gorgias. Gorgias was a famous sophist, enemy of the, enemy of the, so, of the uh, Socratics, enemy of Plato and all that. And he talked about, so these are different models to think about what you're doing with the audience and what you're doing with persuasion. He called persuasion the pharmacon. Here's the word pharmacon um, in uh, ancient Greek. Pharmacon, a drug 
right? So I kind of think of Gorgias as like thinking about rhetoric persuasion like the opioid crisis. Like, what do we do about that? And a lot of people would say, well, we should just ban it. We should just ban words. We should just ban conversation. We should just ban this kind of argument and have facts only. And people love that, right? You watch a political debate, and everybody's on politicalfactcheck.com. There, or there's like a, a meter, and it's like lie, truth. So we kind of want this kind of like ban. But what we lose in that is the fact that opioids revolutionize medicine and revolutionize surgical procedure and revolutionize pain treatment. And they have all kinds of beautiful benefits to them as well. So the ban is, is possible, I guess, with opioids. But as debaters, I know exactly what argument you'll make with that is that you'll establish a black market. I'm sure we'll hear this kind of argumentation. So this is an argument that's evergreen. It always comes up, the black market argument is evergreen. There's certain kinds of evergreen arguments that are good and certain kinds of evergreen arguments that are bad. For example, that's a bad one, I think, because it's just kind of like, I mean, yeah, I guess, but I don't know that. But then there's good evergreen arguments, which are things that are called, um, there's a guy named um, Zimmerman, I think his name is, he's a classicist, and he talked about how the Romans saw the question of should the state torture people as an evergreen argument, which is it could never be absolutely solved because there would always be a situation that would arise where the state would need torture to solve a case. And just to give you some context, torture was much more frequent than it is in the United States today because it was used in criminal proceeding to get evidence out of people, for example. Uh, but the law was no Roman citizen could be tortured. So it led to some interesting cases where the best evidence would come from that and somebody would be like, look, if you think I'm lying, just torture me. And you'll see if I'm lying or not. I'll submit to it. But then the court would have to decide whether or not an exception could be granted for the Roman citizen to be tortured. It's kind of weird. Can you imagine that being part of, like, normal? Like, you go to law school, and it's like, okay, here's when you should advise your client to be tortured. <laughs> I mean, there are I mean, there are lawyers dealing with this in Guantanamo Bay, but it's not normal. That's not normal, everyday, legal uh, procedure. But um, uh, that's kind of the thing. And we're jumping forward. He was several hundred years back. But it was this idea of the pharmacon, the drug. So what is the best way to handle drugs? And this is a very live and interesting debate and a way to think about persuasion, a way to think about audiences. You know, how much trickery should we allow? How many rules should we have? Depends on what do we lose with the good, what do we lose with the bad. Another one from the East, exact same situation, where his uh, new students, Dong Shan, this very famous monk, his new students were like, where should we go to purify our practice? He said, go to a place where there's not one blade of, one inch of grass for 10,000 miles. Because he understood the idea that if, that if you thought you could access a kind of purity, you would get addicted to that and dismiss a lot of good in the name of purity. And I think we could characterize this as kind of the dream of the enlightenment in relation to argumentation is that we are going to burn away all of the addictive properties of grass, all the human elements of argumentation. We'll be left with a pure product, something like Esperanto, that everyone will perfectly understand and everybody, no one will ever misunderstand each other. We'll have perfect argumentation. And unfortunately, this is kind of like, for Dong Chong, where he's, telling, where he's um, talking to his students, he understands that if you tried to go to that place, you would die, your practice would die, you'd be effectively out of it, you wouldn't be able to achieve uh, great stuff. And then if you went to a place where it's plentiful, you could become addicted to it. So it's always this question of, what's your relationship to the thing? What's your relationship to argumentation? What's your relationship to it? Uh, in the world's community, I think there's this concern, like there is a concern among journalism and things like that about the post-fact world, things like that. But to people like this, people like Gorgias, people like Dong Chan, they all lived in a post-fact world thousands of years ago, where they were like, the addiction to the idea that there's something called a fact that would solve everything, uh, short circuits the ability to do the thought and to do the work that makes the thing work. So fact addiction is a big problem, I think. But I think in BP they tried to get away from that, but I think now it's kind of like uh, everyone's kind of so adrift or so kind of bouncing around that you feel as if it would be nice if you had some. It's like when you first learn to skate and you're like, hold on to the wall kind of thing. I think there's a lot of this kind of practice too. It would be nice if we had some kind of a uh, cleaver that could cut through that stuff that we don't. All we have is the practice and the ability to kind of try to say, well, I am the cleaver. Convince the audience that you have it and, uh, and, and then use it. Uh, this is Kai Perlman. He co-wrote a book with Lucy Ulbricht. It's like the best debating book in the world, The New Rhetoric. It's only like 600 pages. It's very easy to read. And all their examples come from medieval French literature, so it's really fun and accessible. <laughs> I encourage you to pick it up for like, you know, just a good hangout book, you know. Um, this is kind of where we are in the world with this idea of that we're going to find a way to access the truth about things without any kind of deception or emotional appeal has short-circuited the, uh, the ability of people to... Um, judge different kinds of conversation or different kinds of things when that 
uh, neutral discourse is not present, people have a lot of trouble judging that kind of stuff. And I think BP is a wonderful laboratory for playing with that, as long as we keep it that way, and we don't try to make it this kind of like uh, end point of the project of rationalism, or end point of the project of the Enlightenment, which was to eliminate human failings and, and emotion from the process of trying to figure out what's out there, or what's true, or what's right, or what's the best thing to do, this kind of thing. Um, this is uh, Lucio Marxitica. Um, so what they came up with with an idea, and I think it works really well for BP debate, is that when you're constructing your argumentation, you want to think about it as being argumentation that is, at, that is advanced to the universal audience. So everyone constitutes the universal audience from what he knows of his fellow men in such a way, I mean this would be like people, what they know of their fellow people, in such a way as to transcend the few oppositions he or she is aware of. So when we're thinking about this, we don't want to think about making arguments that are structured on the rules, but arguments that would appeal to what you imagine to be the best kind of thinking audience that would be influential at the time. And that's what the universal audience is. It's not the right audience. It's an audience that's more than just yourself. So their critique of ration, rationalism is the idea of like the fact that you think it's right and you think it's true isn't enough. There has to be another check in there too, which is like, let me imagine the best sorts of people in the audience. Would they buy what I'm saying? How can I adapt it to where they would buy what I'm saying? And I think this is what they're aiming for in world's uh, rules about judging and BP rules about judging. They just haven't read enough uh, of this stuff. And it's not their fault. It's a kind of an, my field is kind of esoteric kind of field. I mean, it's very American, and very limited and stuff. But people all over the world are writing this kind of stuff. Like these guys are uh, Belgian, Belgian, uh, she's French. But he's building, and they're writing this stuff in, in French in the 50s. But um, the idea is that if you're trying to address a particular audience, like the debate audience, if you adapt or there would be certain arguments that you think are actually very good arguments that you cannot make because you're thinking about you're speaking to a debate judge. And those arguments would be incredibly valuable to practice because practice is the doing of the thing. So then you would eliminate particular arguments that would be persuasive because, you know, that doesn't work in BP. Instead of thinking that way, you want to think, how can I make this argument persuadable to any person who I think would be a model of a smart person out there that could disagree with me or have different politics or what, but would they be able to understand my argument? Would they be swayed by it? So think about old philosophy books you have to read for class. They're writing to this incredibly general audience. They're not writing to other professors or anything like that. Like uh, Michel Foucault is a popular author. He wrote for the populace. He wrote books for the populace. He didn't write for other scholars. So he's doing this too. He's thinking... What are the best reasons to accept my claim that people would be would find accessible? And what, what would they think? What's the way to, to appeal it to them? So think about that when you're making arguments and you're putting it together. Um, I want to leave some time for questions, so let me get to the thing I really wanted to talk about. Oh, this is Ralph Ellison. One of the best essays to read about argument and audience is one of his essays he wrote in 1970. You know Ralph Ellison, right? Invisible Man? Not like, you know, you know, not that Invisible Man, but Invisible Man is like the racial critique of the, you know, okay, right, good. Because sometimes people are like, oh, Invisible Man, so cool. I'm like, no. And they're like, they feel kind of nervous. Um, Ralph Ellison wrote this great essay. It has a weird title. It's called The Little Man Behind the Stove at Cheehaw Station in Alabama. Uh, that's literally the title of the essay. I'm not, this isn't, like, I'm not making it up. I can't make up something like that. I'm not that smart. I'm not Ralph Ellison. Uh, and in it, he talked about how when he was a student, he mailed it in on a performance in Chiha Station where they had to go play as part of Tuskegee education, they had to play at the railway station. And he was like, these people don't know anything about classical music. They don't care about it. I'm just going to mail it in and not care. And his teacher got on him. He was like, you can't do that in the United States for American audiences. You can't do that. Most of you will probably debate in front of Americans most of the time, I'll think. Some of you may debate in front of non-Americans. But this might apply, too, as a good rule to kind of keep in your head about your argumentation, which is... Don't ever really mail it in because his teacher said in every audience there's always a little man hiding in the corner or behind the stove who knows the argument better than you, who knows the information better than you, who knows the traditions better than you, and they will tank you. They'll come after you. They'll think you're terrible at what you do because you mailed it in, because you were like, oh, we can just kind of do, they're not going to, so I can kind of trick them with this thing. So always think in terms that there's someone in your audience who knows more about this issue than you do and use that to temper your model of universal audience. So you could say, wow, the, you know, the other team or the judge, they might know something more than me about this. So how can I approach it in a way or a spirit of sort of humility or uh, approach it in a spirit of this is my best idea where you don't sort of short circuit and kind of say, well, you know, everybody knows that da 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 da. You know, I don't know. This has happened to me several times where I've been speaking and somebody's like, actually, like on the, I'm an ex expert on Ralph Ellison. You've got it all wrong. 
This can happen. It happens quite frequently. So keep that in mind too. I think this essay is a really good one to study if you're, if you're interested in the question of audience appeal, which is, I would say, 99% of debating is that. And 99% of judge briefings are trying to avoid that. They kind of want that out of debate. They want all the judges to judge the same. But even as you break it down into very technical rules for judges to follow, there'll always be people who are like, well, I know what an extension is. And it's not what that person said. Or I know what that is. I know what that is. I know what a counterprop is. And they don't know what that is. So it's always an issue. And so one has to kind of speak, I guess, with a spirit of humility or a spirit of understanding that people's knowledge is as intersectional as their identities might may be. And that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Let's go. Oh, yeah, be brave with argument. It's spaghetti tacos. I don't know if you already that. But anyway, uh, one of the biggest I'm often asked at these things, um, what's the biggest change you've seen in BP in all the time you've seen it? And the biggest change is people aren't brave anymore. People don't make commitments, and people don't, people don't care about a spirit of advocacy. So I used to enjoy judging debates. I know it's hard to believe. Uh, I used to enjoy judging debates because teams would say, we really only have one argument here or two arguments here. And they would go deep, and they would analyze, and they'd explain. And they would do it at a pace of delivery using effect like pause and vocal variety to communicate how much they knew about that. And I found it to be an amazing uh, workshop of advocacy. But now people use this, what's called the spaghetti defense, where they're like, I have nine points of new matter and seven points of rebuttal in this POI. <laughs> <laughs> and this is considered to be normal. Like, no, I, I mean, I just gave a critique that there's no such thing as cross-cultural normality, but here we go. No normal person would find that to, no ordinary, average, reasonable citizen voter person, whatever they call themselves, would find that to be anything other than evidence that you should be locked away as a psychotic. <laughs> yeah? I mean, I think, I think we can, I mean, I don't like to make universal claims, but that's one that I feel is kind of persuasive. So why do people do this? Well, they're scared of losing. They're scared of losing. And if you're scared of losing, if you debate not to lose, you'll always lose. You'll lose more than, you'll have a, you won't have a 500 record. You'll lose more than one. Because you're not going to say, look, here's what they're saying. Like, take the bravery to say, just, here's what they're saying, here's the argument. Here's my responses to that. And as far as our position goes, we have two major things we want to say. Or as opening gov, you're like, look, there are two big reasons why this should be the policy. And you go into debt, into, because I think the framing thing, like I said earlier, takes over the ability for people to argue deeply. So instead of saying, let's frame this between, let's fra frame this debate on trade uh, in NAFTA. Let's frame it there. No, 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 don't do that. Because you can talk about trade broadly in terms of principle, in terms of economic and all that. You wouldn't want to limit yourself to the NAFTA conversation. You could say, let's look to an example of Canada. Let's look to an example of NAFTA. Let's look to the example of Mexico. Let's look to the example of uh, no deal Brexit. Let's look to the example of Germany. Let's look to the example of China. Um, that's a much more powerful way of doing it. Instead of throwing everything you think is relevant up against the wall and whatever sticks. Like apparently, I don't know much about cooking, but apparently with spaghetti, I have a friend who's a spaghetti expert, and they told me that if you like throw the noodle on the wall and it sticks, then it's done. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the whole thing. Yeah. So you're like, this is very contemporary VP strategy is like, I'm going to throw every noodle I can find in my kitchen against the wall, and whatever sticks, I'm going to be like, we stand for justice. This is the most important argument. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I haven't tried spaghetti tacos, but like most of you, when I'm putting together a presentation, I just like Google spaghetti. And this is the image that came up, and I'm like, that, I got to use that. It's not spaghetti on the wall, but I got to use that. It's like, it's just too good. And the caption was like, don't, don't knock. Don't diss spaghetti tacos or something like that. It's something I don't remember. And then it had like a recipe, and I'm like, I don't know. So this looks like desperation. <laughs> You're hungry and you have no money, and that's all you could find. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is the thing I want to get to is some Roman stuff. Uh, be brave with argument. And I think um, one of the things that we overlook when we, and I think I'll probably end here because I want to have some time, about 10 minutes for us to discuss whatever issues you might have or concerns you have about debating. And the floor will be completely open to anything. I'll pull a Gorgias here and say, you can ask me any question you want, and I'll answer it. Um, the, um, the Romans had this model, and this came, ingenium was their word for invention, which is coming up with what to say. Invention is a much cooler way to translate that, but you could translate it as coming up with what to say. And so they had four questions that you would ask of anything. And I would say you could take any topic, any motion you had that you found difficult, you could run it through what are called the stases here. They call them stases in Greek, or we would call them the, um, the four questions or the questions of argumentation. 
and generate everything you can say under that heading. And then when you look at it, you'll be able to decide where your strongest points lie. Okay? So let me talk about what these are really quick. Conjecture is, what is the act to consider? Is something, what's the initial reason why we are considering this? What has happened? And what event has happened? So with debate, this is the easiest one. Now, I teach this in like my public speaking class. This is a hard one because sometimes they have trouble identifying the act. So it's like, what's the act to consider that would cause controversy? What's the thing that happened? So you could say something like, Donald Trump signed a travel ban uh, that affects mo predominantly Muslim countries. That might be the conjecture. And then we can move on from that into the argument. But whatever the event is that caused the reason for there to be controversy. Now, in BP, this is easy because any motion you get, the first thing that you, got, you and your partner need to talk about is what in the world happened that makes this a relevant debate motion? What has happened out there that would make people want to set this as a debate motion. It's becoming less and less relevant as CAs become less and less relevant and start to like try to come up with something really cool or novel. Like I think most CAs in the world have two standards for what a motion is. Is it cool? And have we never debated it before? But this is like this is like the anti uh, rhetorical in the history of the world of what made debate interesting because evergreen topics make it interesting. Like we should be debating torture. We should be debating handgun control. We should be debating all these old, oh, uh, boring, we debated handgun control 17 times. Well, guess what? We're going to do it a lot more. Like, a lot more. Across the world, it's, a, it's an evergreen topic. So, if you ever find yourself in the position of setting debate topics, think about that. Think about what makes an interesting debate, not what makes you look cool, and that you know weird, esoteric stuff, um, which is kind of the standard for motion selection now. I don't get it. Like, I'm happy to debate about Colin Kaepernick year in, year out. I think it's really interesting. And there's a lot there that, and the idea that you would be so arrogant to think that the topic had been fully covered shows that you don't understand rhetoric at all. That would be my critique to people who are like, we have to do new topics that are really cool and we have to have a five page info slide about my thesis. No. Like it's, we're not here to celebrate your intelligence. We're here to debate. And that's the way topics should be written. So think, think, think. Even if you get a weird topic, think, think. What in the world happened that makes this topic relevant. And you and your partner just come up with, like Aristotle said, rhetoric isn't about beating everyone into a pulp. That's not Aristotle's definition of rhetoric. Nor is it, you've got to be the smartest person ever and find the best arguments. No, it's find every available argument. Every available argument in any given instance of persuasion. Every available argument. So this is what we do. We take an inventory. The next thing is definition. How can we characterize this thing that happened? What are the limits? What's in, what's out? So um, we can do this in a minute with a hard motion if you want to. We'll see what we can come up with. Quality, how serious is the act? What's its intensity level? Is it not very intense? Is it more intense? This is what we would call traditionally stakeholder analysis in debate. How many people does it affect? Or what kinds of people does it affect? Those are the two major topoi. Actually, those are part of the Aristotelian topoi in, argu in argumentation history. Would be um, what, what is the bigger and what is the lesser, is the way Aristotle puts it in his topics. What's the bigger and what's the lesser? And if you ask that question, you start to come up with things you could say. And in debate, traditionally, we have two places we go. How many people does this impact? And what kind of people does this impact? So we have a sense in our heads as a community of what the vulnerable populations of the globe are. And we would say, even if it's a small number of those people, then it would be uh, horrible to ignore it, even if that population were small in numbers, because of who they are. You know, like the UN reports, the people who die the most in interstate conflicts are women and children. So we would say, okay, we take this information, we can say these are incredibly vulnerable populations uh, to state violence, the, the unintentional victims of state violence often. And so we have a, a, a serious obligation when we use state power to protect these people. And that would be the kind of a definitional uh, or quality kind of argument. Then action is, should there be a policy or should there be something that we should do? And you notice it's last. And a lot of times, I think, when you're prepping gov, you might do that first. Like, what could be our plan? What could we do? What's our policy? What's our model? Notice the Romans put it last. Because sometimes it's not, you know, it's the last thing you want to think about. Is like, okay, we know what happened. We know how we could define it and how we could characterize it. And we know how we could speak about how bad or how good it is. Is there something we ought to do? And sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's not a policy. Sometimes there is. But what you could do is take a motion that has vexed you, a motion you had where you were just completely dumbfounded. And you could say, okay, let me run it through these things and see if we can come up with a better case. So does anybody have a motion they absolutely hate that haunts their dreams from your debate life? Like you wake up screaming. <laughs> okay, this house values privacy over security. This is a very, that's a very like, um, I don't know what to call it. That's like you a, can make it more specific. No, no, it's like a fast, I guess it's the equivalent of a fastball. Like it's right across, it's right in the zone, but it's a good, that's a good topic. Okay, this house values privacy and security. So let's run it through the stasis. 
Conjecture. What's the act that inspired this motion? What's something in the world that has happened that would inspire this motion to come up? Patriot Act. Hmm? The Patriot Act. Patriot Act. That's a good one. What else? Well, let's think of a more recent one that every debater should be aware of. Snowden leaks. Hmm? Snowden leaks. Snowden. Eh, not as recent as I want. I want something this year. Yeah. Uh, the iPhone encryption. Oh, we're getting warmer. That's pretty good. That's a good one too. All these are valid. I'm not saying they're bad. The yeah. Oh, very good. The op-ed from the White House. That's very good. That one could be it, too. Yeah. The Facebook info. Yeah. Cambridge Analytic and all that. And, like, what about the um, the general protection on privacy in the e European Union as well? Remember all those emails we got? Our privacy our privacy has changed. I'm like, oh, my God. I didn't even know I was signed up for, like, candles that look like dogs.com or whatever. <laughs> our privacy service has changed. And I'm like, privacy? What information do you have about me? I bought a dog-shaped candle for my aunt once. And you're tracking me? Are you that desperate for business? Anyway, all of these are perfectly fine, and it would be up to you and your partner to say, this is the incident. This also helps you kind of introduce your argument, too. You can start with the context of that and set the scene. Instead of starting with something nonsensical like, we, we limit the debate to Western liberal democracies. That has nothing to do with this topic. It's too general. It's like, we limit this debate to spoken words. <laughs> Great. I mean, everybody can get up there and share uncontroversial opinions. The first thing I'm going to do is respond to what they said, and then I'm going to rebuild my case. And then inevitably, there's somebody who's like, <laughs> here, here. I'm like, <laughs> why are we doing this? You know why? Because it's because tradition is comfortable. And, uh, and, and um, what do you call it? Like going through kind of like traditional, repetitive, uh, like stuff like in the church makes you feel like you're a part of a group. And that's the church of debate is that kind of stuff. It's like we must now all stand and sing the hymn and we don't really, you know, we're just kind of going through the motions. We're not thinking, but we're doing the rituals that make us whole, which is saying things that are incredibly stupidly obvious like, I disagree with my opponents. I'm like, well, I should hope so. <laughs> um, or I'm going to rebut now. How does that help me as a judge? I mean, clearly, you know what would help me is you've got, you're like, remember all those emails we got? <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. Or like, the New York Times violated this country's ability to protect itself. How did the failing New York Times do that? You can see what side I'm doing when I say the failing. You know, Donald Trump is so good at these little little micro arguments, I guess you would call them. You know, like um, low energy Jeb and little Marco, and Lion Ted, I love this stuff. I love it. The failing New York Times, I just love that. Um, I don't really think it's true, but I love it. <laughs> Does that make any sense? I, just, I wish I could speak like this. Like I could come up with a nickname for the dean and for the department chair. And all that. I, can't, I can't do it. I don't know. But yeah, if we were to do the op-ed, we could say this is a serious threat. Normally, this kind of journalist would be protected, but we stand here to debate and say that this person should be made public. Because democracy is at stake, not journalistic ethics, something like that. Okay. So we would have that, and we could say we could pick any of those. Then how could we define that? So we have this... Uh, what did you say? Security over privacy? Or? Values, privacy over security. Okay, so value, privacy over security. Definition is important. What do we think privacy and security are within this act? So with the New York Times op-ed example, we do have privacy over security, the protection of representative democracy, the way it's structured in the Constitution, versus journalistic ethics. Now, that is a debate. You're there. And you can say, this is how we're going to frame it. Then after that, you go to quality. And you would say, how serious is this? And now you have an immediate comparison. How serious is it to protect journalistic ethics? I would say quite serious. How serious is it, is it to protect the executive branch of the federal government from a coup, a bureaucratic coup? Which is how we might define this. Did you guys read this thing? Yeah. Don't worry, we got it. We're the unnamed bureaucrats. But don't worry, we're hiding stuff from the president. Uh, whoa, wait, what? Do you understand what a coup is? I know you guys aren't uniform, but... <laughs> that sounds like a coup to me. Yeah. yeah? I mean, but I mean, of course, you don't have to define it that way. What I said, I mean, I'm trying to be persuasive, and you're like, oh, yeah, maybe. It, but I don't believe that. I don't know what I believe about. I'm just making stuff up to show you how easy it is to get. Um, and then action. What should we do? The New York Times should say this, bring this person public. That's our model. The New York Times should do it. Or this person should come forward and do it. Or the Attorney General should see the New York Times make public court. There's a number of different actions you can defend, but it's not necessary in this debate to have a model, I would say. What's necessary to win this debate is to have a number of examples 
that show that it's more generally true than not. But you could limit the debate and say, look, we have all these issues from a conjecture point about security versus privacy, all these things. What holds them together is the defense of one thing over another thing. But you can get as tight as you want on that and try to defend it and prove it and say, you know, these things like when we, uh, like the Muslim ban, you could do that one too. You could talk about that. But what you'd want to avoid is uh, parametrics, which is a word from policy debate you might be familiar with, which is saying, well, we're only going to defend this one instance or this limited realm of instances. We're only going to defend this. And any argument you make that's not within the realm of how we frame the motion, we're not going to address as irrelevant because it doesn't link. It doesn't work in BP, as you know. Uh, you have to be able to defend it largely, but these things, all these things in the conjecture point become strong examples of why you're on the right side of the motion. Does this make sense? This is the way the Romans did all their court cases and stuff. And um, it, uh, it's always audience-centered, and it avoided, well, like one of my favorite quotes comes from the Roman lawyer Cassius Severus, who operated at the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire. And he said about people who did sort of debate and speech events, which were popular in Rome, he said, well, the thing about those people is they think they're clever, but they're clever at their own rating. Meaning they've come up with the rules of what cleverness looks like, and then they celebrate each other for meeting the rules that they wrote. And he's like, but you bring them into the forum, and they'll get roasted, toasted, pal, and I'll be the one there to do it. He was very anti uh, this kind of stuff. Severus was. Um, they're clever. At the, don't be clever at your own rating. Uh, always be clever at the audience's rating. So I think it's good, you know, Severus was a friend of Cicero, and he's a, he's a really cool life. Some of you go read about him, but not a lot's known about him, but except he was like, um, people were really scared uh, when he put down his notes. They knew they were about to get lost. He always prepared, but he really liked improv. He really liked in, uh, going with the context of what he felt. So if he put his notes down, he'd be like, uh-oh, we just lost. And then he would just kind of go with whatever and twist, twist everything, destroy it. They call it acerbitas, right, the Latin word for... What well, we say, acerbic, right? That was the way they described his speech. Acerbic speech. I mean, probably not. He probably doesn't have a lot of friends, but he's good at what he did. <laughs> All right, we have a couple of minutes. We're supposed to go back, but maybe we could five minutes for questions or anything that you might be on your mind. Yes? So, we're allowed to use, like, so common BP debates use examples like you said. But what about things like studies that we found, but like we can't have actual like evidence? Is there a good way to present those where we still have like the integrity of the source or any way, or a way that'll do it that's more persuasive than others? Yeah, I mean it depends on what you think the audience would accept. I think um, there's not a hard and fast rule on that because I've seen people use all kinds of statistics that I felt uh, average people wouldn't have access to or might not persuade average people. Um, but I think in this kind of debate, statistics are really only kind of like maybe a tertiary example you'd use. It's much better to tell stories. I think narrative is a lot more powerful. And it's a lot more powerful if you have a principle that you're trying to prove in your life. Um, the best governments in the world adhere to this principle when dealing with questions of finance. And here's a story about how China dealt with it. Here's a story about how um, Germany dealt with it. Here's a story about how the European Central Bank dealt with it. That's much more powerful than the stats. But sometimes stats can be useful. It's always a... It's always a, a, a maybe on that. But if you have something very precise or very specific that you've done specific research on, chances are it's not going to work. Uh, debate is a wonderful place to show you how right you can be. And you can have all the facts. And everybody's like, what a fool, boo. <laughs> or, <laughs> but I mean, that's the way of the world. That's why, that's why Cartesianism is still, for I don't understand why, still incredibly popular. People are trying to do this. People are trying to be like, you know, let's eliminate human emotion from politics. Let's, let's have uh, algorithms make all our decisions, and passionless algorithms. And, uh, let's have robots do it. Let's have AI. Let's, you know, all this weird stuff. When that's the thing that's the material that really makes things happen to where you consider all the different elements. So I think that it's a good, statistics are maybe a tertiary thing, but they have to be statistics to be accessible. So if they appear in a, a regular news magazine, I would think they're perfectly great to use. Economist, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Time Newsweek. If you're really desperate, USA Today. Or as I like to call it, Mick Paper. <laughs> it's like a, a patty of news made out of lots of different things that you're not sure where they came from. <laughs> Mick Paper. Um, I like McDonald's too, I don't want to. <laughs> but it works, right? Any, anybody else? We've got time for maybe one more. Yes, sir. Um, you get bringing up a counterprop. I have no idea what that is. Good. Keep, keep it that way. Okay. Um, basically, it's a, it's a way to make yourself sound really smart and cool and you know a lot about debate instead of knowing a lot about argument and so much of those things to be um, separated. 
which is an opportunity cost argument. So an argument that opposition can make against the government is to say, if we were to do this model or if we were to believe this, we would lose the opportunity to engage in this other position. And that's a reason that they should lose is because this is a better opportunity. For example, if we all had 20 bucks, we we're like, do you want to go to the movies or should we go to like eat? Right. That's an opportunity cost debate because most of the arguments we generated from the way we would characterize the lost opportunity of the thing that we chose not to do. So they said, look, if we go to the movies, we're not going to enjoy it because we'd be hungry. So we would lose that, you know, this kind of thing. So in other forms of debate, they're called net beneficiality as well. So like, don't do them? I think you can make opportunity cost arguments. But the thing about debate I hope that you would do is not try to do a certain kind of argument because it's cool. Right. That you would look at what's presented, you'd look at the motion, you'd look at, you'd run through the stasis here and try to come up with the possibilities of argument. And then say, okay, what works, given my audience and given what I think is persuasive, what's going to work to help me win this debate? That's really the, that's really the litmus. Uh, people get into all kinds of either content or form of argument that they embrace and they say, this is my identity. And they lose a lot of opportunities to do the practice and to expand their mind. I mean, it comes from a position of thinking you know everything, which is the worst possible position to be in if one wants to be a thinker, if one wants to engage intellectually, is to think you know something. It's the worst possible position to be in. The better position to be in is to say, I think I know something. Let me go verify that. Or an even better position, at least from Eastern thought, is, well, I don't know anything. Great. And then you can move on. But uh, the, I think the best position for debate is to say, well, I think I know something on this topic. Let me try some stuff out. But what do you know? And also with partnerships, it helps, too, to take on that attitude of humility and say, well, I think I know these things. What do you know? Uh, I don't know anything. Okay, great. We're going to go in with the things I think I know, and we're going to win. Uh, and then you kind of think, okay, what's the most persuasive thing here? You look at what you can say. This thing also helps you realize how much you know about the topics and inventional stuff from the ancient world. It's amazing because it, you're like, wow, I knew a whole bunch of stuff. Like this tough motion, we had all this knowledge come out collectively about things that were relevant that could help us frame the debate or come up with examples for the debate. And different kinds of comparison that we could marshal arguments for. It's great. You know a lot. But the ancient people had the same problem you have, which is like, I have no idea what to say about this topic. They had the same problem. And the way they solved it was to say, what's bigger, what's smaller? <laughs> you know, what happened in the past, what happened in the future? Um, what things are going on? How do we characterize them? Are they serious? What should we do? And if you just run every topic through that, you'll find you have amazing cases that just come to you. Who knows where they come from? But I would say content is one. Like, if you really, really get into, like, the work of Theodore Adorno, and you're like, this is my boy and I'm just going to run Adorno arguments every single round, well, you're in trouble. Because like, your, your, your fidelity is to that body of text rather than to persuasiveness. Or, you're, or you take on a certain form of argument. Like you're like, I'm the counterprop person. I want to be known for that. Well, you're going you're gonna to be known for losing a lot. <laughs> and they're, why? Well, they say all this stuff that doesn't make any sense. Okay, that makes sense. I see why they get forced all the time. Um, it's about making sense and appealing to people. And everything else falls under that. And it falls under that in a very, you know, bouncy kind of loose way. Because every time you have a debate, it's, it's constituted, and then everything falls into place. But then it deconstitutes, and the next motion will constitute what's relevant. And that's the way you have to think about it. So there you go. Anybody else? That's a great question. I think we need to head back. All right, great. <laughs>